Welcome to Making Waves. Welcome to Making Waves. Fresh ideas and freshwater science. Fresh ideas and freshwater science, and, and why, why they, they matter, matter to, you. to you. Making Waves. Making Waves is brought to you. Making Waves is brought to you with support from, from the, the Society, Society for, for Freshwater, freshwater science. science. Hello, my name is Susan Washko, and welcome to Making Waves, brought to you by the Society for Freshwater Science. When people think of whitewater rafting, they think of a tourist activity or an outdoor sport. However, there's a surprising scientific application to rafting. Much like skiers can collect avalanche data, river guides can collect river-related scientific information. In addition to the public education that river guides do, they also contribute to ongoing studies and knowledge pools. To learn more about this, Let's take a journey to the Grand Canyon, where we'll talk with river guides and river scientists who might just be one and the same. My first guest is Anya Metcalf, an ecologist with the USGS Grand Canyon Research and Monitoring Center, who can tell us about ongoing science and collaborations with river guides. Then we'll speak with Nikki Cooley, a Diné woman who considers herself a recovering river guide and is currently the co-manager of the Tribes and Climate Change Program through the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals at Northern Arizona University. Nikki will tell us how river guiding connects to indigenous traditional knowledge. Hi, Anya. Welcome. So can you tell me what kind of work you do in the Grand Canyon, and if you were ever a river guide, let us know how that influenced your career choice. Hi, Susan. Thanks for having me. I study the downstream effects of dams and dam management practices on aquatic insects. In Grand Canyon, that means looking at the effects of Glen Canyon Dam on about 300 miles of Colorado River, all the way down to the top of Lake Mead, which is formed by Hoover Dam. I've never been a commercial river guide, but I am a river runner, and my interest in descending technical whitewater has absolutely influenced my career choice. My first river trip in Grand Canyon was a course during my undergrad at Prescott College. It was a 25-day November rowing trip. For my class project, I kicknetted the river for invertebrates to camp each night, as possible, and up in every perennial trip that we stopped at. That was about 10 years ago, and I was hooked. I moved to Flagstaff after graduating, and I've been rowing rivers and chasing bugs ever since. I've seen your publications about the Colorado River's aquatic insects, and a lot of data collection occurs through River Guide facilitated citizen science. Can you tell us how that works? So, collecting bugs in Grand Canyon is hard. The river is notoriously very deep and cold and swift, so much so that it actually has its own whitewater classification scale that runs from 1 to 10 instead of 1 to 5. There's very few places in Grand Canyon where you can safely sample the benthos for aquatic insects. We mostly drift sample off of motorboats. However, even with the safe sampling method figured out, we've still got to access our study sites. Even with motors, sampling in Grand Canyon happens within the context of multi-week expeditions, so the logistics and costs of putting science trips on the water is pretty limiting. Uh, So, in 2012, we started sending river guides out with light traps to sample emerging insects. Sampling adults is a little unusual for a monitoring program, but we found it to be a safe and easy collection method where all the gear and samples for a three-week trip can fit in a single ammo can. Now, during the peak of commercial boating season, we get as many as six or seven light traps deployed per night from campsites that are widely spread throughout the canyon. The spatial and temporal scale that we're able to sample on by working with river guides is unreal, and it's something that we just could not achieve on our own. What do you want people to know about river guides in science? River guides are floating the same sections of river over and over and over again through different conditions and different seasons. It's literally their job to pay really close attention to the river and their surroundings. This makes them incredible resources for scientists to learn from, as they're constantly making observations in the field. While it's also our jobs, as stream ecologists, to pay attention to rivers, most of us simply don't get as much time on the water as guides do. If you want to know about flows, wildlife, vegetation, the best beaches, or the buggiest time of year on a river, just ask a river guide. Okay, the last question is a fun question. In my opinion, the Colorado River is one of the most amazing rivers in the world. I find it really inspiring. What is your favorite thing about the river or the basin? I totally agree. It's a -a one-of-a-kind river. 
Colorado is kind of like the given tree for the entire Western United States. It gives us water for our thirst and hunger, it gives us energy in the form of hydropower, and it gives us incredible recreational opportunities and mind-bending scenery. It carved the Grand Canyon, after all. But also, like the giving tree, it sometimes seems like all of our human demands are reducing the river to a stump of itself. My favorite thing about the river is when it reminds us that it's still wild. For example, in the summer of 83, more than 120,000 CFS raged down Cataract, filled Lake Powell, and nearly took out Glen Canyon Dam. It was a little reminder from the river that we really can't control everything. That's such a great reminder. I I love thinking about that, how big of a hand humans have in the way the Colorado River is at present and how how much conservation needs to go into protecting it further. On that note, we should talk about traditional knowledge and conservation and science. So thanks so much, Anya. Great speaking with you. The Grand Canyon is sacred to many different indigenous groups in Arizona that have called Grand Canyon home for thousands of years. Over those thousands of years, they have accumulated a lot of information about the Colorado River and other streams in the area, continuously passing the information to the next generation. This type of knowledge is called traditional knowledge, and in addition to being a way of life, it's a type of science because it's based on observations. So Nikki Cooley is part of the Diné Nation, known to many as the Navajo Nation, and she can tell us more about how river guiding, traditional knowledge, and science intertwine. Hi Nikki, welcome to Making Waves. Can you tell us about how you became a river guide and scientist? Yeah, Susan, thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you to the Society for Freshwater Science for the invitation to be here on Making Waves podcast. Before I move on, I'd like to introduce myself in the Navajo way, Dinek Eche, Yat E She Niki Kuli Nishye, Kinya Ani Nishlingo, Look at Dine, E Bashishin, Tzatlana E Dashinale, Tro He Dlini E Dashiche. I am of the Towering House clan. I am born for the Reed people, my father's clan. My maternal grandfathers are from the Water That Flows Together clan. Paternal grandfathers are from the Many Goats clan. I grew up in Shanto and Blue Gap, Arizona on Denebikeya. Navajo land. I currently reside in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, And for almost 13 years, I was a commercial river guide working ore and motor trips on the Grand Canyon, Colorado River, but also up in Utah on the San Juan River, where I really learned how to navigate a boat. And I love to tell the story about how I became a river guide. I am lucky enough to be mentored by some amazing men and women, but notably here, my friend Kristen, who has since passed on, introduced me to these gatherings that invited San Juan and Grand Canyon guides um, at the end of the season. Um, or towards the end of the season, where I met this wonderful woman, Laura, who was one of the first female um, river guides in the Grand Canyon. She asked me if I was ever interested in going on the Grand Canyon, and I said yes. And she proceeded to ask me if I was interested in going on a Grand Canyon trip as an assistant. And she explained to me that I would have to unload, pack, help cook, and then hike out at Bright Angel Trail. When she told me that, I was excited instead of being daunted by what seemed um, like hard work, as she explained it. I was never and still am not afraid of hard work. I then went on the Grand Canyon, and I remember being at Lee's Ferry, where I stepped onto the boat And as we started floating down, I felt very much at home and very comfortable. But also along the way, I realized that there was a great need for me to tell my stories of my people 
uh, to the clients who were on the trip, but also the river guides themselves. It was better to hear straight from a native person rather than maybe hearing it um, from hearing it third hand from somebody who heard it from so on and so on. So I wanted to make sure that the stories were accurately told. And that's where, as you said, Susan, um, traditional knowledge um, really became a big part of my life and my work. It has always been a big part of my life, uh, but it's also uh, kind of transferred into my work as an indigenous scientist. My grandmothers have always told me that we are the original scientists of the earth. Us humans have been observing the environment, the skies, the animals for uh, since time immemorial, since we were first created to be on Mother Earth. And so that led me to Northern Arizona University, where I received two degrees in forestry, with my master's having an emphasis on traditional ecological knowledge. And I was mentored by some amazing people, um, such as Tom Elkos, Wally Covington, Ron Trosper, but also um, mentored by um, Gifford Pincho and Aldo Leopold through their many writings. And so in a sense, when you ask me how I became a scientist, I always have been one. And then I got trained in the Western way of being a scientist. So that is, um, I guess, my answer to that, that we are all scientists because we do trial and error throughout our lives. We do observations on what works best for us to live our best lives and whatnot. So that is a great question. How are river guiding and traditional knowledge connected? So as a guide, whether you're going down the river or down the trail, the whole premise of your job is to keep your clients safe and to give them an experience that they will never forget so they can return or recommend the same journey to their friends or family. In addition to that, you want to connect people to the area, the region that you are guiding them through. You want to connect them to the history, whether it's geologic, um, the botanic, or the ancestral history. And when I say ancestral, I mean, and I refer to the people who used to live there. They're referred to as the Anasazi um, or runes. You know, those are some of the terms that are used but for us indigenous people, we feel that they still live there um, through their spirit um, because they made a home there. Someone was born there. Someone died. Someone cooked a meal, made a pot um, or caught a fish there. So we really try to convey that part of our history to the people and how important the area where they resided was to the to to them and and to the survival of their people and how they would journey dependent on what season it was and so a lot of that you learned through reading books or listening to a lecture from a university anthropologist or perhaps a nonprofit that's hosting someone that has the knowledge about the region you are guiding in and so along with that comes the traditional knowledge that um, that's also referred to as indigenous knowledge or local knowledge. And I like to say local knowledge because that's more inclusive of people beyond indigenous or native communities because there are a lot of our relatives who came from overseas, m settled here, migrated to this area, um, and they may have the German roots or African roots, and they learned how to survive in the area in which they live. Um, they, they have lived, and now us as their next generation, we're learning um, how much they survived through um, 
the hardships, whether it was um, through money or the lack of money or the lack of jobs, um, lack of food, or even uh, uh, major weather events. So when you ask the question of how river guiding and traditional knowledge are uh, collect are connected, um, I believe it's the knowledge that is the key word there. Um, traditional knowledge is passed down through generations, and it used to be all done in the oral um, way of doing it, verbalizing it to the next generation. I mean, that's how I learned about the different plants that are used for medicine, for jewelry, for ceremonies. And it's, you could say the same with uh, river guiding. You know, some of that knowledge is passed down through river guides. And I learned how to row from these amazing women that were, uh, ha- were doing it, had been doing it for a long time um, prior to my arrival and um they and you know the the landscape changes um people do and now uh, people change also there's always a better way of doing things and it's up to you to ask those questions but also up to you to ask um or should i say to hear what people are saying and how they're passing down that knowledge to you so it's intergen intergenerational teachings Um, that really make that connection uh, between river guiding and traditional knowledge. And what role does traditional knowledge or local knowledge play in the conservation of the waters of the Colorado River Basin? The role of traditional knowledge, and as I said before, also known as indigenous knowledge or local knowledge, in conservation and climate change um, adaptation and mitigation is steeped in the tribal indigenous history of the Colorado River Basin, where there are currently 24 tribal nations um, and more that are unrecognized by the federal government and Western society. Before the onset of settlers, tribes were maintaining the balance of subsistence, food gathering, growing, and harvesting, including hunting, while ensuring that the waters and the lands were not polluted or overused. And, and they maintained that respectful balance between, uh, you know, give and take. As I mentioned before, traditional knowledge is an intergenerational method of maintaining the foundational knowledge of conservation, of caring for the land. And this was done as a community with other tribes. But after the f- tribes were forced off their lands and forced to sign treaties, downgrading them to smaller tracts of lands called reservations, you know, where the Ecocultural resources were unavailable. They were foreign, unrecognizable, and in some cases overused. The act of forcing tribes to the confines of reservations created, essentially created a domino effect of the lands, waters, and animals now being managed instead of being respectfully cared for. There came the centralized framework of land management, which created an oppressive set of regulations created, developed by people who were not from the area. Consequently, traditional knowledge of the tribes of the local communities was seen as hearsay and anecdotal. But through the persistence of tribal indigenous peoples, This is finally being seen as the true science that it's always been. And Susan, I I strongly believe that the scientific community, um, notably the Western scientists and the public, can always do more by supporting the role and the use of traditional indigenous local knowledge in conservation, um, adaptation and mitigation efforts by the tribal, indigenous, and local communities. It's absolutely imperative that we have the support of the scientific community because it builds that bridge between Western scientists and the indigenous scientists, um, traditional knowledge holders. 
you all here listening today, you have the platform to support and advocate for those of us who are trying to care for our Mother the Earth, Father Sky, and all of the animals. Your voice and support can elevate our efforts um, and in doing so, we are working as a community to care for the land. As I said to Anya, I think the Colorado River is so inspiring. What's your favorite thing about the river or the watershed? Thank you, Susan. I think that's a great question that we should all ask ourselves. What do we find inspiring about water? And in particular, for this conversation, the Colorado River watershed. The Navajo term, Tua'e'ina, water is life, speaks volume to how much our lives depend on water. Not just our lives, but also Mother Earth um, and all of, all of her children and all of our relatives, meaning the animals uh, and the plants, depend on water. We all know that around 60% of our bodies are water. We cannot survive without it. And the Colorado River watershed sustains millions of plants and animals, but also communities across seven states. That is amazing. Because of that, we should do better to try and preserve what we have now and what we could have by respecting water so our future generations can have what we are enjoying today and also for the survival of all the plants and animals the biodiversity of our environment is really important to the survival of our um, planet but also the Colorado River uh, watershed is full of history whether you enjoy John Wesley Powell's stories or the stories of my people, um, the Hopi and the Paiute, Havasupai, Wallapai, and all of the other tribes who hold the Colorado River Basin, a very culturally significant place. We all can do better so we can have what we have now, but better in the future. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's been a joy to speak with you and to learn from you today. Yes, Susan, I would like to thank you for the invitation to speak on Making Waves. I've really enjoyed our time and thank you for the questions because I feel like these questions inform the larger community of the different perspectives that are out there. And this is a perspective that is often not always included in conversations. And so I really appreciate you and the Society for Freshwater Science using the platform to include our voices. So thank you all for listening, and I hope to catch you downriver someday. Thank you. Today's guests gave me so much to think about. The hardworking scientists involved in understanding the Colorado River include not only the kind of scientists that we know from the Society for Freshwater Science, but also river guides and everyone else, particularly the indigenous peoples of this area who have such a long history with the watershed. Bringing all these groups together is the best way to protect our precious water resources, such as the Colorado River and tributaries in Grand Canyon. I'm Susan Washko. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Making Waves. You've been listening to the Making Waves podcast. For more info, for more info, for more info, please visit us online at the Society for Freshwater Science webpage. Tune, Tune in, in next time, time for another fresh idea in freshwater science.